something like that. Look at this one. Okay, these, these are error rates for the different numbers of days. And you can see Adolfo is, is you know, pretty low. And actually, these two-day error rates are inflated because we move longer distances now than they could 50, 70 years ago. Uh, here we've got with W.W. W. Brown, we've got error rates of, or possible error rates of 1 to 5 percent. With Lamb, it goes up a bit more. With Del Toro Aviles, kind of in the middle. But look at Phillips. Essentially what it comes down to, I got to meet Phillips before he passed away, and he very clearly admitted to me that sometimes it was necessary to fix the localities on his specimen tags so that he wouldn't get in trouble with the Mexican government. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Okay? So this is just an example of what you can do when you've been very, very thorough. If you're only seeing 5% or 10% of a collector's specimens, or if the collector didn't collect very much, you won't detect any errors. Because this depends on dense sampling of the collector's productivity through time. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to give you two worked examples just for some fun. Okay? First example is a Taraco. And I downloaded all the data for this Taraco from Vertnet. So Vertnet is covering North American vertebrate scientific collections. Um, in general, Vertnet's attention to uh, data quality has been quite high, given that one of the main authors has been one of your instructors here. Um, but as we've said earlier in the course, you have to remember that it all comes back down to the data that the original source is serving. So VertNet can't be responsible for, for example, a misidentification. Maybe, I, I, without a doubt, there are some birds misidentified in the KU collection. When I find them, or when my colleagues find them, or my students find them, we'll fix those. But until then, those are going to produce problems. So VertNet can't essentially pre-filter. It can help collections to appreciate the errors that they have, but it can't eliminate them. So let's look at this. Here's the initial search, and you see some of the data we have in Sudan, in Malawi, in Burundi. I downloaded the data and put them on a map. Now right away, you guys are probably thinking some things about this bird. Okay? And one of my points in this talk is that this is the data cleaning process. This is the data uh, exploration process. You're saying, huh, most of the records of this species are in sub-Saharan Africa. And then it looks like there's one in Chicago and one maybe in New Mexico um, and one in Cairo. What's going on? So right away, just using your, your sense as a biogeographer, you should be maybe even worried about that, but you should be worried about all those records. Okay, you should be thinking, huh, I gotta look closely at those records. Maybe this species is an invasive species in, in North America. It isn't, um, but maybe. So, Right away, you're already involved in this process. But let's take it a couple steps further. We can look at internal consistency in this data set, which is to say, I can take, notice this country coverage in my GIS, it has names. So I took all of those records and I attached to them, based on the latitude longitude, I attached to them the name of the country in this other coverage. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying this decimal latitude and longitude falls in South Africa. Sorry, sorry. This decimal latitude and longitude actually falls right here. 
but the record says South Africa. So something's happening. Okay? So essentially, remember, I've got textual locality information, and I've got a latitude-longitude coordinate. And what's happening is the latitude-longitude coordinate is telling me something different than the textual. And so that should signal to me a problem. In this case, um, even though the textual description in the record says South Africa, the point falls in Egypt. What do you think is happening? Okay, certainly it's possible that the latitude and longitude could be interchanged. But in this case, there's actually something very, very, a bit simpler. Notice one line goes through both Cairo and South Africa. What if I simply forgot to make a southern hemisphere record negative, which is the convention in GIS, right? Western hemisphere is negative, eastern hemisphere is positive in longitude, and northern hemisphere is positive, and southern hemisphere is negative in latitude. And this is a very common problem where essentially, notice that the decimal latitude is a positive number, if you simply switch the sign, that point is right in South Africa. And then we have consistency with our textual description. Here's another example, maybe a bit different. The country in which this point falls based on its coordinates is Zaire, Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was an old uh, data set I was using. But the textual description is Sudan. That's a, it's, it's an inconsistency, but by a small distance. And in fact, very frequently what you'll see is these inconsistencies in little corners of those coverages. And sometimes it is actually Sudan, and it just, you know, falls just on the other side of the line because of a rounding problem or something. In this case, I'm guessing it's imprecise georeferencing or something of that sort, okay? Something happened where maybe a locality here erroneously was placed just a little bit too low in latitude or too uh, far east, west in longitude. Regardless, something's wrong, I'm guessing with the, the numerical georeference. So here's what that one looks like. You see it's in Sudan. And look at this. Here's our, here's our georeference. Very interesting that we have an integer. We don't have a decimal. You know, how many times in your life have you been able to say, I'm standing exactly on 4 degrees north? Not 4.01 degrees north or 3.98 degrees north but exactly four. So when you see that, you should be a little suspicious that maybe it's not sufficiently precise. So those two specimens at the Field Museum, maybe they've got a problem there, and maybe that's what's doing this, okay? Those are all maybes. I wanna know more about those specimens. I wanna see the original uh, data label and I want to think about it. Here's another one. Um, my data record says Burundi, but the country name in my, in my GIS coverage says Rwanda. Okay? And I guess I'm going to pick on the Field Museum today. But that's actually pretty far away from the border. If I look at the data record, uh-oh, again it's Field Museum. But look at that, again I have an integer. So I'm now pretty worried that for some reason, maybe they lost the decimals by some problem in how they were manipulating the data. Maybe, who knows what happened. But something happened with the latitude there that made it jump into the wrong country. 
okay? I don't know what the real answer is, but I do know there's a problem. Okay, and now I have two bits of evidence of that problem. One is the integer value, which is always a bad sign, and the other is that it puts it in the wrong country. Okay? So now let's start getting, in the Taraco example, let's start getting some in extrinsic information. So I can go out, this is, this is a vertebrate, so I have, I have nice, rich sources of information. I can go out to Avabase, and this kind of gives me a view of like the last 20 years of the taxonomic history of this species. And all I want you to see is that the species that we're paying attention to is considered a subspecies of all of this by some authors. Okay, that might mean some other taxonomic treatment. And actually down below on this page you get the whole layout of who considered it what. Well, remember that VertNet is just a portal. Okay, data flows from the, the data owner, the museum, through VertNet to my computer. And so some museums are still using taxonomies from 1975. Some museums update their taxonomy every month. If this species was split, maybe in a study in 1990, then I can get one name from one museum and another name from another museum that actually biologically refer to the same thing, but they're different names. Okay? So back to our distribution map, remember the first thing we were worried about were these things that were really far away. Well, it turns out that this complex of three species that I just showed you in the, in the taxonomy, it's all Southern Africa. So right away, right, some problem. You know, maybe conceivably they got the sign wrong on both hemispheres and these points actually belong down here. I didn't check to see if that would fix those. Or maybe that is the coordinates of the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago where maybe they had one of these Taracos. It takes going back to the data record and seeing. Okay, we already figured this one out. But obviously, we don't want those coordinates to represent this species. Now, let's go into Sub-Saharan Africa a bit better, and we still have problems. All of those points are outside of these range polygons. Okay, you can also see a problem here where it's off the coast. That's probably a precision or, or a problem with, with um, longitude or latitude. But the bulk of these points fit, and we can say, well, these kind of don't. Now, you know, these West African points, I'm sure they're not part of this complex. This one, I don't know. We're talking about just getting it up to here. So that's possible. I need to check on that. Maybe I'll go, you know, look at birds of East Africa, and, you know, maybe these maps are wrong. So I need to really pay some attention to this. This one, you remember, we didn't like because it says Sudan and, and it falls in Zaire. So now we have two pieces of evidence that make us suspect that point. Okay. Remember, all I'm doing is playing. I'm just exploring a data set. Then I can go finer. Within the range of the species, within the, you know, the points that I think probably pertain to that species. Here's a vegetation map. And I can do things like take all of those occurrence points, put them on the vegetation map, and what I see is that most of the records, or the, the, the plurality of records, is in closed deciduous forest. But also notice that some of those records are coming from croplands, or open grassland, or savanna. Maybe that's okay but I can go check. And if I find it in the wrong vegetation type, 
Maybe there's a problem. So again, I might signal that as a, a possible inconsistency, external inconsistency in my data set. We can do the same exercise with, with climate parameters. Temperature and precipitation in this case. The maps aren't really visible. Um, but essentially here's a plot of temperature versus precipitation for all of the records in sub-Saharan Africa or actually within the range of the species. Um, here's a plot of how they fall out in terms of annual mean temperature and annual precipitation. And what I want to do is I want to look, well, you know, clearly the middle of this distribution is here. And I've got an outlier here. And I've got a bunch of outliers here. And then in this dimension, I've got some extreme values there. So let's look at them. 